Hey everyone, Colin here at the top. I just wanted to clarify something about this second piece of audio for the Frederick Douglass narrative. So I've taught this in the past, and in the past I taught it over two days or two class periods, which is why I've divided this week's audio into two parts. But you may hear me refer to this as part two, and all I mean by that is in your book, I discuss pages 1193 through 1228 in this second half of this week's audio. So I don't want you to think there's something else you need to read. It's all the same text. It's just because of how I elected to divide it. So if you have any questions, if you need any clarification, I think everything makes sense, but please contact me and I'm happy to clarify. Okay, thank you. In particular, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the literary merit of this text, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. I want to talk about Douglas's feelings about slavery, the American South, and Christianity, and how those three ideas intersect with one another in troubling and hypocritical ways for Douglas. But I also want to talk a bit about this distinction that he teases out near the end between the North and the South, because I think it's an interesting point he's making, and it's certainly one of the moments where he's behaving in an overtly or an overt rhetorical way. But let's start with the literary merit of Frederick Douglass's narrative, because, and it should come as no surprise to you, in 1845, when Douglass published narrative of the life that it was met by some with a fair amount of scrutiny, which is to say many people didn't believe that a black former slave could have written something so powerful and so emotionally resonant. But of course he did. But this is not new. This is not unique. In fact, it's not unique for us this semester. Phyllis Wheatley, for example, I don't know if I mentioned this in class or not, but before she published her book of poetry, she was subjected to this committee, and I can't recall the exact number. It was no fewer than 12 and possibly as many as 18 white men who, in effect, questioned her today it might feel like a PhD dissertation defense. She was asked to defend this book of poetry she wrote. And again, the, the suggestion was, and for many, this was not subtle, but this was, this was quite overt. The suggestion was she didn't write this. She couldn't write this because look at her, she's black. Right, And if you're thinking, well, have we also experienced an articulation of this idea, just think back to Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia and the distinctions he made in, what, query five about the natural differences between white people and black people. But this is a text of the highest literary merit, and I want to identify a couple of ways that you can actually see the craft of what Douglas does. And one of them, and this might seem superficial, but I think it's important, just noticing the length of these different chapters. So chapters one through nine are comparatively short to chapter 10, which I'll talk about in some detail later. But if we think about what are the hardest parts of Douglas's experience in slavery. It's certainly the year he spent with Mr. Covey, and it's important to notice that this happened. So everything from his year with Covey to his growing sense that he must seek freedom at any cost, even at the cost of his life, his failed attempt to liberate himself, but then his later liberation, all of this happens really in chapter 10. So while that might seem superficial, just the length of chapters, I think you could make a compelling point or case that by elongating chapter 10 in the way he does, Douglas is perhaps subtly suggesting the 
feeling of this moment in his life, this moment of his time in slavery, that it felt like this long, unrelenting day, just like for us, maybe as readers, it feels like this long, at times, unrelenting chapter. But there's this other decision he makes, and he explains it away by suggesting that it's, it's pragmatic for him not to mention how, actually, he successfully escaped the South, how he escaped Baltimore to freedom in the North. And his explanation is quite simple. And it makes sense when you think about when this was published in 1845. This is before the American Civil War. This is 15 years before the American Civil War. And while not only the war itself, but also the eventual Union victory seems inevitable to us. For someone living in 1845, while the prospect of a war might seem inevitable, the fact that the Union won, or the fact of a Union victory, would not have been inevitable. In the same way for a lot of us living through this COVID-19 pandemic, if everything is fine after, to future generations reading about this, it might seem self-evident to them that everything was fine. And while there was certainly reason for concern, and while there was certainly reason for fear and trepidation, to them, looking back, it might not seem as perilous and precarious as it does to those of us living it. We don't have that same kind of certainty that potentially future generations will as they study this moment in time. And I would encourage you to just apply that same principle when thinking about publishing a book like this in 1845. There wasn't the same kind of security as it might seem to us today from our vantage point. And that's Douglas's explanation. But I think there's a literary reason to do this as well. And I'll make two points, and I'll leave it to you to decide ultimately what you think, whether you agree with either of those points, or if you have another reason to, or maybe you believe Douglas, or maybe there's another reason. The first reason is, I think it leaves the narrative itself in, and it clouds the narrative itself in a degree of mystery. Douglas doesn't answer all of our questions. Yes, we know that he reaches the North, he achieves freedom, but we don't know the particulars of how he arrived. And that leaves us speculating wildly about what it looked like. Because I think for a lot of us, especially when we think about the genre in question, this slave narrative genre that I spoke about last time as being extremely popular in the 19th century, maybe one of the expectations that we have is there will be this rousing description and this exciting and action-packed description of whomever, in this case, Douglas, but this rousing, action-oriented description of this person leaving the horrors and atrocities of the American South and fleeing to a freer, more egalitarian North. But that's not what Douglas gives us at all. And so one possibility is, and again, I'm thinking about just the literary reasons to do this, why this is good from a literary perspective. It's always a good idea to leave your reader asking questions, and I think Douglas effectively does that. I think that's certainly one reason to think about this omission, aside from his rather pragmatic explanation. And the second is, by not spending time, by not spending pages describing that process of migrating from the south to the north, Douglas reorients his reader's attention to uh, different things, and we're left considering different ideas because he doesn't give us that rousing escape from south to north. So perhaps more than anything, we're left considering the reasons for his departure, and less the departure itself. And for Douglas, and this is important, slavery, of course, was this 
endlessly oppressive and violent institution that exploited black bodies for the accumulation of capital for a small minority of white slave holders and the sorts of emotional, psychological, and physical traumas associated with that whole enterprise, and the way that Douglas in particular heroically antagonizes and fights that system, I would argue we're left thinking more about those moments and less about the bits of anxiety Rightly, my God, the bits of anxiety he may have felt while taking this journey from south to north. So again, my point is, I think by omitting that part of the narrative, we're left to consider other things, in particular, the reasons for this flight from south to north. While it might seem self-evident to us why someone would want to do this, I think the important point, again, just thinking about this narrative within an historical and cultural context, which I hesitate to do, but I will here, this would not have seemed so self-evident to many people, many readers, regrettably. And Douglas even addresses this at one point, that there's this way that slavery creates this, this condition or, or slave owners attempt to create this condition where the worst thing a slave could ever want is freedom. And I think what Douglas wants us to know and what he wants us to understand is that's all, if you don't mind, that's all just bullshit. And, and by not giving us this narrative of, of the actual escape itself, by, by just turning his head away from it, we're left thinking about those things, the way slave, according to Douglas, the way slave owners in the American South create this impression that freedom is the last thing someone should want, to even the way Douglas antagonized those ideas at times quite physically, but emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, etc. So again, it's important to think about this not just as a text, but to think about it as something of the highest literary merit. This is, this is not just a cultural artifact. This is literature, however you want to define that. And I think that's something worth saying. But why don't we spend a bit of time talking about some of Douglas's criticisms of Christianity in the American South, and in particular, at least from his perspective, how Christianity is, is perverted at times when it's used to support and advocate on behalf of the institution of slavery and the hypocrisies that Douglas saw in the American South with slave owners who professed a pious Christianity. And while I won't identify every passage or every moment, I think a great place to start is on 1195, and this is chapter 9. And here, Douglas writes about Thomas Auld, his master, and we spoke a bit, I believe, about his brother, maybe his younger brother in earlier chapters, and that person, that Auld, will return. But here, he writes about how Thomas, who had not been particularly religious, found, I, I think the language people use is, is he, he found Christ, right? And, and this is what Douglas writes, I indulged a faint hope that his conversion would lead him to emancipate his slaves, and that if he did not do this, it would at any rate make him more kind and humane. I was disappointed in both these respects. It neither made him to be humane to his slaves, nor to emancipate them. If it had any effect on his character, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways, for I believe him to have been a much worse man after his conversion than before. Prior to his conversion, he relied upon his own depravity to shield and sustain him in his savage barbarity. But after his conversion, he found religion sanction and support for his slaveholding cruelty. 
And I'll certainly come back to this in just a moment, but as a way of offering a bit of additional context, go to page 1206, because here Douglas, and I think he further develops this point by suggesting that Christianity in the American South was used in many ways as a cover for the cruelty and the brutality and the barbarity of slavery. And this is what he writes on 1206. I assert most unhesitantly that the religion of the South is a mere covering for the most horrid crimes, a justifier of the most appalling barbarity, a sanctifier of the most hateful frauds, and a dark shelter under which the darkest, foulest, grossest, and most infernal deeds of slaveholders find the strongest protection. Were I to be again reduced to the chains of slavery next to that enslavement, I should regard being the slave of a religious master the greatest calamity that could befall me. For of all slaveholders with whom I have ever met, religious slaveholders are the worst. I have ever found them the meanest and basest, the most cruel and cowardly of all others. It was my unhappy lot not to only, excuse me, it was my unhappy lot not only to belong to a religious slaveholder, but to live in a community of such religionists. Very near Mr. Freeland lived the Reverend Daniel Whedon, and in the same neighborhood lived the Reverend Rigby Hopkins. These were members and ministers in the Reformed Methodist Church. Mr. Wheaton owned, among others, a woman slave, who, whose name I have forgotten. This woman's back for weeks was kept literally raw, made so by the lash of this merciless religious wretch. He used to hire hands. His maxim was, behave well or behave ill. It is the duty of a master occasionally to whip a slave to remind him of his master's authority. Such was his theory and such his practice. So I think you could arrive at a couple of different conclusions here when reading Douglas's thoughts about Christianity and slavery. And I had mentioned this earlier, but I think for Douglas, the sheer hypocrisy is part of the problem for him. Christianity is a religion, at least as I understand it, that advocates for love, mercy, understanding, patience, etc. But we're seeing not that. In fact, we're seeing the complete opposite. But I think for a man like Frederick Douglass, who, despite learning how to read much later in his life than most of us do, and just thinking of himself and being a learned and literate man, the way these religious figures or these slaveholders who also ascribed to a set of religious convictions, to see them take the Bible out of context in this way, to, to cherry pick moments from the Bible and to use those moments, and by doing so, ignoring these other moments that would contradict this larger argument they make about the Bible and Christianity actually supporting slavery, I think for a figure like Douglas, this is quite awful to him because it seems to betray the kind of intellectual curiosity that really defines him in the second half of this narrative. But more than anything else, I think it's this idea that people in the South who own slaves will use and exploit almost anything to sustain the enterprise of slavery. It doesn't matter who they hurt. It doesn't matter who they objectify. None of it matters. All that matters is that we sustain this institution, that we sustain this division between white and black, that we sustain this notion that there is this natural hierarchy. They will exploit and abuse anything and everything to sustain that idea. And for someone like Douglas, the fact that they would use religion to do that seems to offend him almost more than anything else. And 
I'll leave it to you to decide what you think of this, because this is certainly not the first time, and I, I think if you wanted to identify larger themes that run across this semester, as I've tried to teach you about this early period in the early American literary tradition, the way the Bible is used and the way Christianity is used and deployed would certainly be one of those overarching themes we see with figures like Bradford, a use of religion and Christianity in a way that seems quite benevolent and communal. At times with someone like Mary Rawlinson, there's some inconsistencies with how she deploys references to Christianity. With someone like Phyllis Wheatley, the way she seems to justify, I think you could read it this way, and we talked about how generations of, of readers read her this way, the way she seems to justify the enterprise of slavery because it, and, and by doing so, she's using this kind of utilitarian method of thinking. It led her to Christianity, therefore, maybe there's some, there's some benefit to be extracted from this awful institution, but we see Douglas yet again making reference, like many writers have this semester, to Christianity and how Christianity is deployed in in the legislating of just life in the United States prior to the American Civil War. And it's not like the American Civil War ends this under any circumstances, but this is, it seems, one of those larger themes that has just run across this semester, the way Christianity is used and deployed, sometimes misused, sometimes perhaps used appropriately. And I think this is one of the moments where certainly what Douglas argues is that this is a misuse of Christianity, but I think his critique is one that tries to perhaps realign our understanding of how Christianity could be expressed in a benevolent way, in a positive way. And I think we see this with a lot of the abolitionist writers that we read a couple of weeks ago. So from here, why don't we say a bit about, and I mentioned this a bit earlier in the lecture, Douglas really crystallizes his thoughts about slavery in these last two chapters. I spoke about in the last lecture how Douglas, at one point, he seems to blame the institution itself, this nebulous idea that is slavery. At other times, he seems to indict individuals. But all of this becomes a lot clearer, I would argue, in chapters 10 and 11. And I want to speak specifically about this moment when he describes what he thinks. He provides this, this sort of analysis of this weak holiday that was customary after Christmas before the new year, because I think he arrives at certain fascinating conclusions. This is quite savvy analysis. He's doing uh, sociological, psychological, anthropological work here. And again, I think this just speaks to his remarkable intelligence and capabilities as a writer. But follow along with me. I think I'll start here on 12.05, and I'll read a bit because it's important. I'm at the top of the page. The holidays are part and parcel of the gross fraud, wrong, and inhumanity of slavery. They are professedly a custom established by the benevolence of the slaveholders, but I undertake to say it is the result of selfishness and one of the grossest frauds committed upon the downtrodden slave. They do not give the slaves this time because they would not like to have their work during its continuance, but because they know it would be unsafe to deprive them of it. This will be seen by the fact that the slaveholders like to have their slaves spend those days just in such a manner as to make them as glad of their endings as of their beginning. Their object seems to be to disgust their slaves with freedom by plunging them into the lowest depths of dissipation. For instance, the slaveholders not only like to see the slave drink of his own accord, but will adopt various plans to make him drunk. One plan is 
to make bets on their slaves as to who can drink the most whiskey without getting drunk, and in this way they succeed in getting whole multitudes to drink to excess. Thus, when the slaves ask, excuse me, thus when the slave asks for virtuous freedom, the cunning slaveholder, knowing his ignorance, cheats him with a dose of vicious dissipation, artfully labeled with the name of liberty. The most of us used to drink it down, and the rest was just what might be supposed. Many of us were led to think that there was little to choose between liberty and slavery. We felt, and very properly too, that we had almost as well be slaves to man as to rum. So when the holidays ended, we staggered up from the filth of our wallowing, took a long breath, and marched to the field, feeling, upon the whole, rather glad to go from what our master had deceived us into a belief was freedom back to the arms of slavery. I have said that this mode of treatment is part of the whole system of fraud and inhumanity of slavery. It is so. The mode here adopted to disgust the slave with freedom by allowing him to see only the abuse of it is carried out in other things. And I'll stop there. And I, I think Douglas's point, again, this is so incredibly smart, is what slaveholders would do by allowing them this freedom was allowing them to see the grotesque excesses of freedom. Because complete freedom, my God, if you could even envision it, I must be quite frank with you, it just sounds horrifying, right? No restrictions under any circumstances. I think I've told you this before, that one of my least favorite things is to go to a restaurant, you know, when we went to restaurants, and to see a five or six page menu, right? It's it's the, the gluttony of freedom can just be too much for me sometimes, but Douglas is talking about something fundamentally different here. I think his point is, is this, this, gluttony that is complete freedom is then taken to an extreme in this in this week it feels a bit like a like a bacchanal of some kind and the effect according to douglas is at the end of that week the slave is then left to think well my god if this is what freedom looks like if if this is what freedom feels like maybe maybe slavery and subjugation is actually better and Again, I cannot emphasize just how savvy this analysis is because it's a way of taking this idea that the the good slave owner, and I, I think, and again, this is more of an idea than anything else, and I say this with air quotes, of course, there is this idea, and I think Jefferson was often framed in this way that, that and we know that that's, of course, not true, but he was often framed in this way as, as the good or the benevolent slave owner, the one who treated his slaves well. He, he is not the, the coveys of the world. And I think there's a way, and I think what Douglas is often suggesting is that, well, maybe those figures, my God, they're just as bad, if not worse, than the rest of them because they afford the slave to see freedom as something that it's actually not, and that's only a way of reinforcing this institution. So even in those moments, and again, I, I think for someone like Douglas, it's just the depravity of every single moment that is slavery is quite visible in these kinds of moments, even when you think someone is attempting to be, or, or when you are encouraged to think that someone is trying to be nice, trying to be generous, trying to do the right thing. Under the auspices of this system, there's no way to do the right thing if you own slaves. Everything is the wrong thing. Even these sorts of performances that seem to be acts of generosity, I think Douglas effectively reveals how they're clearly not. And that's, that's really quite smart. And I think those are the moments, that's I must confess, those are the moments of this narrative that I think I like the most when Douglas shows his prowess as a thinker and when he just offers these kinds of observations and then pivots to this kind of analysis. Can you imagine being a reader in the mid-19th century, maybe having certain assumptions about 
white people and black people and then reading this and just having it fundamentally disrupt your understanding of the world. Douglas is so spectacular in his ability to to do that. And with all of that said, I, I think it's worth, because Douglas says as much, I think it's worth at least identifying what I would perhaps call, I don't know if Douglas would call it this, the residue of slavery, because I think one of the one of the interesting points that Douglas makes, and this is where he really ends the narrative before this appendix, fleeing the American South and earning one's freedom, that's not enough to uh, eradicate the experience and the residue of slavery. And I think here at this moment near the end in perhaps the final paragraph, he writes about how he, he really previews how he becomes this significant figure or he's becoming this significant figure in the abolitionist movement. You could really imagine that this narrative is something of a superhero origin story in some way, considering where it leaves us. But he makes this point that he felt a bit of trepidation speaking in front of white audiences. And this is what he says. This is on page 1224. I felt strongly moved to speak and was at the same time much urged to do so by Mr. William C. Coffin, a gentleman who had heard me speak in the Colored People's Meeting at New Bedford. It was a severe cross, and I took it up reluctantly. The truth was... I felt myself a slave, and the idea of speaking to white people weighed me down. I spoke but a few moments when I felt a degree of freedom, and said what I desired with considerable ease. From that time until now, I have been engaged in pleading the cause of my brethren. With what success and with what devotion, I leave those acquainted with my labors to decide. What a lovely way to end, my God. But more than anything, this line, the truth was I felt myself a slave, and the idea of speaking to white people weighed me down. I think this candid moment is so important because I think the point that Douglas wants to make, and maybe this idea that he leaves us with at the end, is fleeing the South and earning one's freedom, it's not enough to eradicate and reconcile the trauma of one's past. And you can almost imagine this, this whole narrative as an attempt to uh, understand what he experienced, but an acknowledgement that understanding one's past and understanding the traumas of one's past and fighting like hell to get to a position where your current life doesn't mirror your former life, while all of that is useful and productive, it doesn't eradicate the past. It doesn't, it doesn't change the trauma of the past. Douglas was born into slavery. He spent a significant amount of his life as a slave, and he became a free man, but he carried the burden of slavery with him. And while this narrative ends in a rather triumphant way, when you just think about the hero's journey, this, this Joseph Campbell arc, that doesn't mean, as, as he suggests, there isn't some residue that he carries. And I think there is something quite quite wonderful and quite powerful about that articulation. A reminder, I suppose, that freedom isn't always enough. Maybe there needs to be more. So with that said, I'm, I'm well over the 30 minute mark. There's so much more I could say. I, I, I wanted to say this one thing though about, and this is around page 1222. I won't read directly from the text, but I think it's interesting how Douglas speaks about his expectations of what the North would look like. And what he basically says is, you know, I really thought the North would look a bit underdeveloped. I thought the North, it would be, it would be livable and functional, but I didn't think there would be really any signs of wealth or prosperity. And, and his point was, without slavery, 
as it exists in the American South, I simply didn't think there would be the mass accumulation of capital that exists in the South. But to his surprise, that's not true. And I think this is important because this is one of those moments where Douglas is overtly rhetorical. His point seems to be for if, if, if slaveholders in the South aren't using religion as a way of justifying their behavior, they, they often then pivot to economics, right? Without slavery, the economy of the South would fail. But I think Douglas's point by mentioning how the North looks is, no, you don't need slavery to live in a prosperous society. And, and maybe ironically enough, all of this economic prosperity and all of this economic necessity that you gesture towards and reference, it's actually a lie more than anything else. Because from his perspective, in the American South, within this institution of slavery, he saw a lot of shoeless children, a lot of poverty, a lot of desolation, and the North looked quite utopian to him. And let's be clear about something. Douglas is is playing a bit fast and loose here, but he's doing it for a very understandable reason. And his point seems to be if if you're of a mind that slavery is necessary for economic reasons. Maybe you don't like it as a practice, but you understand why it must exist for economic reasons and economic purposes. Hey, look to the north. It's not like it's this it's this desolate wasteland of, of economic depravity and, and desolation and depression. That's not true at all. So that, again, it's a moment where maybe Douglas isn't, because Let's be clear, it's not like the North was this utopia and the South was not. There were still problems in the North. There was still racism in the North. But he has a larger rhetorical point that he wants to make, which is if you pivot toward economics as a reason and economic prosperity as a reason to sustain the institution of slavery, there might be more to it than just that. In the same way that if you pivot to religion as a way of justifying slavery, there's more to it than just that. So anyway, I wanted to mention that before we go, but I, I would love to know what you think about this narrative. It's of all the things that I ask you to read or that I've asked you to read this semester, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's horrifying at times, but Douglas is endlessly readable. He is this heroic, almost super heroic figure in ways that I find quite satisfying. Again, I, I think if you just, if you just adjust it a little bit, you know, you could, you could see how a lot of superhero narratives follow a similar sort of trajectory. And, and I think that's interesting as well. Just again, thinking about the literary merit and the literary quality of Douglas's narrative. But if you want to write about it, I think there's a lot of ways you could do that. And I'll leave it to you to decide all of that. I'm just rambling here at the end because I don't know how to end this lecture. Okay, I think I'm done. I'll just say goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Have a good night.